Hello everybody and welcome back to Drag Tries Week. This is the very last episode we're going to be doing for the Drag Tries Week. And what I'm going to be looking at today is some more coding and some kind of some very basic work on starting to get my Pokemon AI that I wrote ages and ages ago working again and also working a lot quicker. So what I've got currently sitting in the background here, if we have a look at this thing, this is some very basic Lua code which we're going to be using to our advantage and actually getting it to interact with some of the stuff that's going on here in the Pokemon emulator and getting it to run some of that stuff. So I'm very new to Lua, which is why the code I've got is very short, it's only 24 lines long. This code here is literally just an example code to read some of the bytes in the memory and see if I can make that work for me. So to show you kind of what this thing does, I'm going to reload this file. We're going to load it from here and now we have our code ready and running so if I run the Lua code it tells us we are at the map so that's the thing that this what that's what this is currently doing so it's reading the value of memory that tells you what you're currently standing at zero is a map one is a wild battle or a battle with a wild Pokemon and two is a trainer battle now let's just show you that in action so if we go all the way through here and actually enter the Elite Four and start up the trainer battle here. You need to get all the way through all of this stuff and into the trainer battle. Once the animation loads, we should see, there we go, bam, trainer battle pops up underneath the map title. Now, I'm pretty sure if I reloaded this, I would just see map pop up again down here in the bottom. So that's all this thing does right now. But it's a really good framework because this means now we actually know when we're looking at a map, when we're in a wild battle, when we're in a trained battle. So we can now tailor the stuff that the emulator looks for, or the code looks for, in these circumstances. Because while you're roaming around and like tapping buttons out, there's no point knowing what all of your Pokemon are like, and you know, how much attack strength they have, because you just don't need to know that. All you really need to know is your X and Y location, so that's what we can do. We're in under here, instead of this print map, we can do a print X and Y location, which will be quite cool. We can definitely do that pretty easily, in fact. The other thing we can do, of course, is that we can then actually print all of our Pokemon stats and stuff in Wild Battle and Trainer Battle, but not only that, we can actually print the stats of the opponents that we're up against. So in a Wild Battle, there's only one other Pokemon, and in a Trainer Battle, we can actually print the stats of all up to six Pokemon that the opponent could potentially have. So yeah, this little framework setup is actually really quite cool, and it means that we can use these things to determine more about what we need, and also save ourselves time reading and writing to the memory of the game. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to put in a little bit more stuff in around here. I'm going to change up this file just a little bit, and we'll see if we can get this to actually tell us our position and a little bit more about our Pokemon and that type of stuff too. So this is kind of what I was talking about here. Now that I have kind of mapped out and read in the X and Y locations, I can then print those under the word map, and so I can actually know where my X and Y positions are. Now the one thing that I have done here is I've updated this outside if statement. Now what this if statement does is basically stops it from just continuously printing, because this code runs very, very, very quickly. So without this if statement, it just prints every single time it goes around this loop. But with this if statement in place, it only prints anything from in here if something has changed. So this is what this means in here, is old location is not equal to new location, all the old X position is not equal to the new X position, all the old Y position is not equal to the Y position. So that basically is just a statement asking if anything has changed recently. And if it has changed, then we're going to come into here and we're going to find what type of location we're at, and then we're going to print whatever we need to print to get these things working. Of course, the more I go through this, the more this line is going to have to be kind of pumped up and pumped up and pumped up. But eventually I want to change this from having all of these values just kind of saved globally to having them stored in an object, but we'll get more onto that later on. I'm probably not even going to be able to get to do that in this episode, because like I said, I'm very new to Lua and writing objects and stuff like that can take a little bit of time, especially in a new language and especially in a scripting language, which is different to most of the things that I've written uh, programs in before. So anyway, let's take a quick look at how this all works and what this all does. So if we run this code, you can see that I'm standing at x8y7, and if I go into my 
game and I start moving around, you see that I can slowly increase my Y value by going this way down the screen, 12, 13, 14, 15, and I can go back again. And as you can see by the way this thing is reacting, this is a hell of a lot faster than the Pokemon code that I was like that I've done in the past because this is literally just interacting with the game directly so it doesn't need to wait for a file to be read in and out to actually be able to find these values it can literally just find these values exactly when I put them in which means that I could actually now write a little bit of code and I could have it sit there and press buttons until it actually worked and did whatever I wanted it to do so I could have it set up so that the code attempts to try and find wherever this door is. Now this door is probably going to be, so I'm at 1x and 8y, so it's 0x, 8y is where this door is supposed to be located. Now, with a little bit of fancy code and fancy maneuvering around, I could probably get this code to actually find that particular position just by randomly putting in key presses and looking at whether or not that is closed the gap between where it is and where it wants to be. And if you kind of cycled through that enough times, it would eventually hit enough buttons to end up in the right location or close enough to the right location to actually get started. But yeah, so that is what this is doing. And we can actually kind of keep moving around. And as you can see, these things don't um, stop at all. Like they just keep going. As I move around the place, they just keep changing with my position, which is really cool. I really like the fact that this scripting language exists and I can just add all of this stuff in and read memory exactly when I need to read memory, which I, it's just really awesome. Anyway, I'm going to add a little bit more code in here, and we might even get a little bit of printing going on our current Pokemon and our opponent's current Pokemon as well. All right, let's try that out. So now we're actually getting towards a kind of serviceable, or at least slightly serviceable, actual piece of useful code here. So I've added a fair amount since the last cut, so you will notice at the top here we've got a... Pokemon list called Poke List, and this literally has all of the names of every single Pokemon in the order they were created. So most people will know that Rhydon was the very first Pokemon created, and so therefore it takes the number one spot in this list. And the reason this list is ordered exactly like that is that when we read the Pokemon in from memory, this number, like the number, will be based on this particular list. So Rhydon will be number one in memory, and Clefairy is going to be out here at number four in memory. So they don't actually follow the standard Pokemon numberings, or the Pokedex numberings, I should say. Now, of course, down further, we've added a few more variables. We've got player Pokemon. This is the number for the Pokemon, and the old version, once again, this is so that we don't get double printing and stuff happening. Same thing goes with the HP. So now we're actually displaying our current HP but not only that, we're going to show the enemy Pokemon and the enemy Pokemon HP as well. And then down in here, when we actually kind of scroll into this stuff, we end up having all of these read memory locations. So each of these memory locations is a particular thing. So player Pokemon and player Pokemon HP versions one and two. So there are actually two bytes here that we need to read in. And these two bytes actually get added together. They don't get uh, used correctly. They don't get used in a kind of standard, normal, logical sense. They actually just get added together to become the Pokemon's full health. However, you will see I don't have Pokemon Health HP 2 at the top here. That's because I'm literally just using this as I need it because this variable here is usually set to zero. If a Pokemon's health is under 500 and something, then this bit here is actually set to zero. So it's not needed and it's not going to be any use. So it would have just cluttered up a gigantic if statement that checks if something has changed. Um, so I didn't, yeah, I didn't need that up in my declared variables. I can just declare it here and use it as needed inside this loop. Now, and then of course, going down further into this loop, we actually print these values here once we've actually determined we're in a turn of battle. I can, of course, put those same things up into the wild battle as well, but considering that right now all we're dealing with is moving around the map and fighting the Elite Four, I figured that it would probably be a safe bet just to leave it down in here. And then of course down off the bottom of the page, and I can't scroll down far enough, I just have all of my declarations that set the old value to the new value, and then it kind of swings back around here and things get going again. So let's take a quick look at this one. I'm going to pull this in a little bit further. So as you can see right now on the screen, we're in a trainer battle. I have Jolteon out and he has 93 HP and the enemy has Dugong out and he has 75 HP because I've already hit him 
with a Thunderbolt. So now let's try that again. So if we take a Thundershock out and hit the Drugong with it, he's now down at 11 HP and I'm still on 93 HP. And if we kind of keep going, okay, Drugong used Rest and regained health. And so now you can see that this has actually updated again, and now we've got Drugong on 169 HP. So if I attack him once more while he's asleep, we'll end up going down to 108, which is perfect. And as you can see, the damage that is actually calculated gets done before all of this stuff starts sliding, which means that when I actually hit this, as soon as that animation is done and the shake happens, you'll see that we get this change happening. And this is a very, very fast change, which is why I'm absolutely loving this Lua stuff. However, it's taken me a long time to kind of learn Lua and learn how to get it all up and running and interacting with this AI and with the emulator. So I can't actually do any more for now because I've run out of time to record this video. So please let me know in the comments below if you like this type of stuff, if you want me to come back and do some more coding on camera, because if you do, we're going to restructure this entire file and we're going to build that AI again in Lua so that it runs exceptionally fast. And in fact, Considering that I can crank the speed of this VBA emulator up, we could actually probably get an um, emulator and an AI set that could defeat the Elite Four in minutes because it is just going to be able to go that fast and run the emulator that quickly because there's going to be no time delay. It will just be able to read things as it needs them, and that will be absolutely perfect. So, like I said, if you're excited about that, you're interested in that, let me know in the comments below, and I will film some more of this because I'm definitely going to be doing a little bit more and actually building this AI anyway. So if you guys want to see that, let me know and I will definitely film some more and throw those up as I do them. But of course, we will kind of, you know, build that in parts and I'll show you a little bit more about what I'm doing and I'll try and explain how everything works and how things go. And yeah, we'll end up kind of rebuilding what I've got and then actually build a fully intelligent learning algorithm that will attempt to play all Pokemon battles, I think, is where I'm going to go with this. I really want to try and extend this and see how far I can push a Pokemon playing AI in this space. Anyway, I've kind of rambled on for long enough and I don't have any more time to do any more coding for today. So yeah, let me know how you think this has gone. And yeah, if you guys like it, also let me know if you want some source code and stuff because I can definitely push this code out to you guys so you can have a look at it and fiddle around with it and see what you can get done with it. Anyway, that's it from me, and that is it for Drac Tries Week. I hope you guys have enjoyed, and I'll see you later on this week with another Sky Saga video.